Welcome back to the Chaos Ball Podcast. We're back, we're back, we are back after the All-Star break. Two All-Star break-related podcasts. Back to the regularly scheduled programming of Mariners Baseball, a.k.a. Uh, Purgatory. But, I would like to say, offer it. I love J.P. Crawford. That is all. That is all. Uh, the Mariners are playing right now. I'm recording. It's Sunday. The game's almost over. It's the bottom of the 8th. They're up 2-0. A very uh, mariners type of game. Some unlucky BABIP stuff, but also just the offense continues to flail. Uh, but the pitching, Bryce Miller looked pretty good. He looked okay. I feel like I feel like the blister is still bothering him today. I don't think his pitches were really spinning like they normally are, but he gave five no-run innings, five hits, three Ks, and then the, the bullpen, Brash Topa Munoz, up until this point, and now we're headed to the top of the ninth, has been perfect. Uh, 2-0, top nine, assuming we're getting C.S. Wald, uh, Seattle's dad, to close this one out. And if he closes it out perfectly, I mean, that's a classic Mariners ball game. Couple run, shutout, amazing bullpen. I say that as, you know, that hasn't happened yet. It's going into the top of the ninth. We'll see if they win. Let's hope they win because they lost the first two games of the series to the Tigers, which great start to the second half. Just an amazing start to the second half. Couldn't couldn't have asked for a better, better start. They've picked up right where they left off. <laughs> drop, drop two against the Tigers and then probably, I don't know, if they win this one, then, you know, drop two, win one. Because they just absolutely refuse to go on either a long losing or winning streak. I think the longest winning streak of the year is four games, and the longest losing streak of the year is also four games. So that is something that kind of tells you where the team's at. But before I get into a bunch of just random Mariner stuff, I'm not going to focus too much on this Tiger series, really. Not much to focus on. They're just losing the games. There's, I don't know. It's not much else. They're just not an amazing baseball team, but baseball reference player of the week. It was not on the midweek pod because that was a midweek pod. I had already done the player of the week. You know, I can't, I can't do two. That would be players of the week. And that's not what it is, but this one is a fun one. It's, it's a horny player of the week. I'll warn you. And, uh, you know, his, his prowess was more known for his, not off the field stuff, but managerial, executive, ownership, basketball even, uh, the name is Cum Posey. Yeah, you heard me right. Cum Posey, otherwise known as Cumberland Willis Posey Jr., which is, God, that's a loaded name, but he's known on Baseball Reference and by a lot of just baseball uh, writing and such as Cum Posey. Now, Cum Posey was a real jack of all trades. Uh, he was born in 1890, June 20th, 1890. Ooh, the summer of 1890 was great. Uh, it, was, it was a great time. I remember that. And it was when Composi was born. Now you go, if you go on his baseball reference, it just shows his managerial career. And he was 93 and 95 and eight ties as well as a manager in the major leagues. But Really, he's not known for his his play on the field. I know he played a little bit of ball, but he really rose to fame or is now infamous for his managerial slash ownership career of the Homestead Grays. I'm sure you've heard of the Homestead Grays. I feel like I've mentioned the Homestead Grays before, but he created that team, essentially, in, uh, in 1912. He played with the Homestead Grays in 1911 and then was the manager by 1916 and then became the owner in the early roaring 1920s and he built it into a powerhouse a absolute powerhouse franchise in uh, in black baseball he won won a lot of pennants won nine consecutive pennants which is absolutely crazy uh really just interesting he he was just kind of very opportunistic fella, apparently. I don't think he was too amazing on the field playing baseball, but he definitely knew baseball, and he knew a business opportunity when he saw one. He he ended his playing career 
very quickly after he started it for the Grays and just became uh, the field and, and business manager. And then he took full control of them in, in the 20s and ran them as one of the greatest baseball successes and empires ever, really. Um, like, they, they a real test of time, if you just go back to what I just said, uh, from the 20s until, I think, 1946 is when uh, he sold the team. He was manager, owner, club official. That means they survived the Depression. And not, that's, a lot of teams went by the wayside in the Depression. Obviously, it was the Great Depression. It was one of the great ones, you know. But very impressive, uh, his his career in, in business. And really, I wanted to talk about him as the Baseball Reference Player of the Week because on Baseball Reference, his name's Cum Posey. I mean, how can I not talk about that on this podcast? That's right up my alley. So Cum Posey, and that was his baseball, his baseball prowess. You know, you can go read about more about what the actual Homestead Grays team did. That could take up the whole podcast if I talked about that entire team and those years. Um, but he was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 2006. He's on the Washington Nationals Ring of Honor for his significant contribution to the game of baseball in Washington, D.C., uh, as part of basically the Homestead Grays. But he was also a basketball player. He was actually, uh, allegedly, apparently, one of the best African-American basketball players of his era, playing in the early 1900s and through, like, the 20s until he started basically being a mogul and owning the Homestead Grays. His peers and sporting press, according to Wikipedia, called him an all-time immortal. He, I, I, he, he was, I don't even know, like, what his game was like. There's not much like that, but listen to this quote. The mystic wand of Posey ruled basketball with as much eclat as Rasputin dominated the queen of all the Russias, observed by the Harlem Interstate Tattler in 1929. Wow, they do not name newspapers or publications like they used to. The Harlem Interstate Tattler? That's sweet. Uh, he played basketball for his high school, Homestead High. He played basketball at Penn State for two years, uh, and then he moved to the University of Pittsburgh, where he earned his pharmacy degree, apparently. And then he also formed a um, a basketball team that won the Colored Basketball Worlds Championship in 1912. He also then played varsity basketball at Duquesne University under the name of Charles Cumbert. God, Charles Cumbert, dude, come on. And he led that team in scoring for three seasons through 1919. He is enshrined in the Duquesne Hall of Fame, Sports Hall of Fame, under his actual name, not Charles Cumbert. That's just what he was playing playing as back in the 1910s. What was college eligibility like back then for basketball? Because he, he played at Penn State for a couple of years, and then he got his pharmacy degree, and then a year later he joined Duquesne and played three more years, four more years? What? How does that work? Um, point is his prowess in basketball, he was way better basketball player than baseball player, but he was an absolute mogul in the baseball world. So that's what made him that, that, that paper, but he was also elected to the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame in 2016. So very interesting, very crazy jack of all trades type, type man in, in our, our cum posy over here. He was a star player in high school in football as well, which is crazy. He played football really well. He played basketball really well. He played baseball okay, but he really showed his, his prowess and business playing bas- or, uh, playing baseball and, and the Homestead Grays. So Homestead Grays, super interesting. Highly recommend going to read, watch, whatever, anything about the Homestead Grays baseball club, and you'll without a doubt see a lot of come come posy in there so that's the b ref player of the week come posy shout out to him shout out to one of the weirder names i've come across on baseball reference uh but now let's get into the actual baseball talk of it all shall we and the mariners won paul seawald closes the game out with three strikeouts give up a hit but uh what a game classic mariners game 2-0 bullpen was exquisite 
the offense was bad, but good enough because the pitching is amazing. Good, thankfully they won. If they got swept at home coming out of the All-Star break by the Tigers, honestly, canceling the season would have been on the table, but now we're back. It's okay. It's fine. Everything's going to be fine. Just keep telling yourself that. Doesn't matter if it might not be true. The season is going... Eh, poorly? I don't know. It's just going mid. Like, they're playing about what the the projections were saying they were going to do. The highest projection I saw this team at was, like, 85 wins. Like, all the projections were saying, like, this is, this is an 82 to 84 win team. And I blindly ignored that in my preview because I was like, the past couple of years, they've just smashed their projection out of the park. They're just not a team that succumbs to the math equations of predictions. But they're kind of doing it so far this season. But I don't know if it's going poorly. I mean, there were just a lot of high expectations after making the playoffs last year. I think that just kind of ruined some people's expectations of exactly what this team was going to be. But I guess it's going poorly in the sense of expectations versus reality. I mean, even the announcers are dropping like flies this year. Like, Mike Blower still hasn't called a game. He's still suffering from, like, vertigo, which is terrible. Um, I don't even I don't even know if he's going to call a game this year. Ever. We've had how many different booths this year? Like, ten, maybe more. Like, just combos of different people. They've had, like, Dan Wilson, Mike Cameron. It's been a lot of Goldie and Angie in there. Um, Dave Sims has been in and out. Rick Riz just got in an ATV accident, apparently, and is not calling the radio right now, which is insane. That was not something I expected to come across my timeline. Like, what's going to happen next? Like, Aaron Goldsmith gets gets mono for three weeks and can't call a game like what's gonna happen he's been he him and angie have really been the two that have been the healthiest this this year from uh from the the booth perspective like what is happening up there Uh, when i read the atv accident shit about rick riz all i could imagine was in you know in the movie napoleon dynamite and is it napoleon's i think it's his grandma in that in that movie but she She's going a, like ATVing in the dunes with her with her homies, and she gets in an accident. That's just what I imagined was the Rick Riz. Like it was just all gas, no brakes. Rick was like, "No, nah, fuck it, I'm going going as fast as I can. I don't care about how old I am." And just gets hurt that way. Like I hope he's fine. It from all the tweets and stuff, it sounds like he's fine. He just is, needs needs a little time. It's just not something I expect to see come across the timeline. Um, but yeah, that's like the announcer situation has just been wacky. And honestly, I think the pairing I've liked the most is Goldsmith and Mike Cameron. Honestly, like I, I like Goldsmith a lot. Dave Sims, I, I love, um, just as a Homer, uh, not, he's never been like the best at calling baseball games, but he is so well liked and is very much a fan of Mariners baseball, which I can appreciate from a regional broadcaster. But I think Goldsmith and Mike Cameron might have been my favorite pairing. I really like them together. Uh, Goldie and, and Angie have been pretty good, too. I just, Angie, I feel like, tends to try to explain everything, which is fine. Uh, I don't listen to the broadcast 100% throughout all of the games. Um, I also think she's doing a fantastic job. F- she's done a fantastic job for just being thrust in there. Like, that's clear. That was not, she had, she did not allow have an off season to prep to do that like this is totally unexpected so credit to her for even stepping in and doing this many games um but give me more goldie and mike cameron honestly give me just mike cameron i love listening to mike cameron uh but yeah the, I, I had to mention the rick wrist stuff that was so interesting so weird and in terms in terms of on the field i don't know man i, I like jp jp crawford awesome been great i just this offense doesn't do it for me at all Mike Ford, he's doing it for me, though. However, should I victory lap? Should I victory lap about my Mike Ford propaganda that's, like, really come to fruition, or should I wait? Like, is now the right time to to claim uh, not all of the credit, obviously? Most of the credit goes to him, but not a little bit of the credit. I mean, I feel like I did start the hashtag, hashtag year of Mike Ford. I was saying that during spring training, and I genuinely can't believe he's doing this 
Uh, he's been actually quite productive in the DH spot. It's been amazing to watch. He's actually, I mean, he's putting together some some of the best at bats I've ever seen him in his career put together. Craziness, craziness. He got pinch hit in the ninth of the game the other night and hit a home run for naught, which was confusing why he wasn't starting in the first place. But, you know, why start Mike Ford when you can play Dylan Moore or Colton Wong, you know? Like, those guys have been awesome, right? Another thing, and I'm jumping all over the place because I just refuse to minutely break down what they've done this weekend. I will not do it. However, a theme from this weekend and just the, the, the whole season in general, warning track outs. I don't think I've ever seen a baseball team hit this many warning track outs in one season. And it's only been like 55% of the season so far. And the amount of warning track outs this team has made is insane. And I, I wouldn't be as fumed about this if visiting teams were also making a lot of warning track outs. And they're making a fair amount. I mean, that's what happens in Seattle. But... Like on Friday against the Tigers. I feel like there were like four deep warning track fly balls, and the Tigers had two home runs that were wall scrapers. It's just weird. It's just weird. It's it's something you shouldn't notice, and if you do notice it, that's how you know it's bad, like the amount of warning track outs the team makes. It makes it worse that Dave Sims the biggest flaw in his game is knowing what is actually going to be a home run off the bat or not. Somehow, in his years of calling baseball, he still hasn't managed to really get that down, and he never will. That's just part of his 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 thing. That's just part of his announcer profile. And it's honestly, it's pretty funny. Uh, a little infuriating sometimes, because... Sometimes the camera doesn't trick you, but sometimes Dave Sims and the camera tricks you and you get real excited and then it's just like, oh, out at the warning track. Real tough. Real tough sometimes. It's weird. It's just, I wonder I wonder if there's a stat. Is there a stat that can track warning track outs? I feel like StatCast has that capability. Maybe I need to deep dive on Savant or something. That's got to be a capability. I mean, you can see like how many home runs the team or different players with hitting different ballparks on stack cast, which is cool. But I want to see warning track outs. Who's leading the league in warning track outs made from an offensive perspective. Yeah. I, I'd be willing to bet it's the Mariners. I don't know. Other Mariners stuff really, again, just trying, just trying to avoid talking about this team with a broad brush. Cause it's, I'm not trying to overreact to this tiger series. They're not, they're just playing like they used to. It, it's, At this point, we just have to wait until July is over, until the trade deadline is passed, and then really assess what they're going to do. Because changes are going to have to be made. They cannot just keep rolling out Dylan Moore and Colton Wong and A.J. Pollock. They just can't. They're giving them jack shit. Like, it doesn't matter that you're paying Wong and Pollock, and even more, like, he's on arbitration making, or they extended him for, like, three million years, right? I don't care if you're paying them. Send them down to AAA. Like, you'd have to, I don't know how many options, like, Moore has, but I know Pollock and Wong would have to be DFA'd. No one would pick them up. Like, it's not like you're risking losing them. Plus, if you lose them, you lose them. Who cares? I think you just got to eat their contracts this year and just live with it. Like you're going to have to waste a good amount of money down in AAA. And maybe they rake in the PCL like a lot of hitters do and come back up and hit a little better. I don't know. You just can't. You can't continue like this. I'd be very surprised if all three of those guys were on the Major League team by August. Maybe Pollock is still on the team. I cannot see them holding on to Colton Wong or Dylan Moore at this point. Like They I, they shouldn't be on the team. They're offering nothing. They're actively detracting from this team winning baseball games. And we'll see. They're not going to get to trade them. Like It's it's a sunk cost. Like No one will take them unless you attach a blue chip prospect to them no one's going to take them and you wouldn't do that to get off contracts of such marginal money in the grand scheme of things like it's they're going to be off the books Dylan Moore won't that's a tough one but like Pollock and Wong they'll be off the books I by the end of the year it's just you can't keep playing them you just can't they're giving you nothing the problem is the alternatives like what are the alternatives you're going to roll out Taylor Trammell again 
I don't. <laughs> I I guess you could try. Cade Marlowe, I guess he hasn't been raking in AAA, which is worrisome because you should rake in AAA because it's the PCL. I don't know. I don't know what they do. It's going to have to be through trades. But that being said, Wong has been a little unlucky, actually. Fun fact. So Mike Petriello of MLB.com wrote an article the other day. And it was looking at what the shift has done this year, who has benefited, who has been, who has not benefited, who's been a little um, unlucky, actually, who has been reaping the benefits, who hasn't it helped, which, interestingly enough, two Mariners are on this list. And also, he's he expressed a lot in this article, it's estimates based on stat cast data. Like, it's not gonna, it's not an exact science, it's estimates, but I think you can you get a sense of like if the guy's near the top of these estimates, he's definitely been one of the more helped by the shift. So the most estimated hits gained due to these new positioning rules this year, number one's Jose Ramirez with 14. Number two on the list is Jared Kelnick, Jerry Bonds with 13. So he, uh, it's not just that he's been helped by the shift. I mean, he's obviously been, he's been hitting the ball harder this year. Vast improvements from last year, but he's definitely gotten some some help from the new shift rules, which is great. And like, thir- if it's estimated 13 hits gained, that is a significant amount of hits gained compared to maybe what they wouldn't have been last season. Like, that's that's a decent chunk of your average for the first half of a season. 13 hits. So Jared Kelnick benefiting a little bit from these new shift rules. And then you go down to the part of the article that tells you who it hasn't really helped very much, which is really interesting. Jeff McNeil, Adam Frazier, Jeff McNeil minus seven, like estimated hits lost from these new shift rules, weirdly. Adam Frazier minus six, tied with Colton Long. Tied with Colton Long, minus six. Uh, really, that's it's not <laughs> it's not great. So... A player can still be bad and get unlucky. A good example right now is Josh Donaldson. He's been quite bad, but also pretty unlucky at the same time. I think Colton Wong has been a little unlucky, mostly really bad, but a little unlucky. He's he's getting the short end of the stick in a lot of ways right now, which is tough. I thought I just wanted to mention that because it was interesting. Two mayors were on that list. And uh, it's interesting to see for years to come how we're going to try to measure the benefits of this uh, clearly there's there's ways to do it as expressed by this article but super interesting thought I'd mention it here and that got me thinking about Colton Wong it got me thinking about how the Brewers second base is doing right now so obviously the trade the Colton Wong uh, for Jesse Winker and Abraham Toro trade the Brewers were thinking, obviously you save a little bit of money getting rid of Colton Wong. Maybe they knew something that we didn't. He obviously had a down year last year, but uh, he was also hurt a little bit throughout that year, which made me a little bit more optimistic going into this season that he wouldn't be as bad as last year. Boy, was I wrong like everyone else. Uh, but they did that. They are, they had second baseman to play, and they didn't really need to be paying Colton Wong anymore. And so why not get Toro, who's been in their triple a lot this year bounced i think up up and down like once or twice just utility man it's not like he's not useful and then why not just take a flyer out on jesse winker see if he can recapture what he did in cincinnati a little bit um but i want to see how their second base production was doing since getting rid of colton long because obviously we know the mariners second base production has not been very good without jose caballero it would i think it would easily be the worst in the league uh, maybe tied with like the, the White Sox right now, which is crazy. Their second base production is the worst in the league by OPS. The Mariners' second base production by OPS is second worst in the league, 29th out of 30 teams, because uh, you're getting a zero OPS and five play appearances from Dylan Moore. You are getting 
a 433 OPS in 19 plate appearances from Sam Haggerty. You are getting a 465 OPS from Colton Wong in 182 plate appearances. Oh my god. And then you're getting a 789 OPS from Jose Caballero in 135 plate appearances. So without that, I think they'd comfortably be the worst. And the Brewers are not doing that much better, actually. They're uh, just two spots ahead of the Mariners and 27th out of 30th in the league with Luis Urias, who, when they made that trade, I was like, he's probably going to just take over their second base job then. I think that's probably what they had in mind. No. 28 play appearances, 460 OPS. Then you have Bryce Terang and Owen Miller, two youngsters, 581 OPS for Terang and 185 play appearances, and 652 and 110 for Owen Miller. So not quite as bad as the Mariners, but not great. And then they have this dude, Andrew Monasterio, who just get, came up, uh, I want to say, like, what, one, two weeks ago. 35 plate appearances, 730 OPS, but my point here being neither second base positions for either team has been good. They've actually been pretty awful, bottom five in the league, comfortably. Uh, so nobody won that trade. Nobody won that trade at all. And then if you look at war, I'm looking at Fangraph's war here, second base-wise. The Mariners right now, second base war, ranks 22nd in the league, which... A lot of that has to do with, I'm guessing, Jose Caballero's stolen bases. They have .4 war right now from second base. I think Colton Long is giving you negative at that position, and I think Jose Caballero is giving you a positive league average bat with uh, a good amount of steals and base running value. I think that's entirely where that war is coming from. And like solid defense, but Fangrass war is not as defensive focused. So 22nd out of 30th. Fangraph's war for second base for the Mariners. Not as bad as you would think, given the OPS. And then Milwaukee, 17th, slightly better. They have one cumulative Fangraph's war from their second baseman this year. So it's really neg like it's negligible what uh, that trade did for everyone. Uh, it's a wash. It didn't work out for unless like Colton Long starts to go on a tear or something, or or Jesse Winker starts to go on an absolute hot streak to end the year. I don't foresee this trade working out for both, and really it's poetic. Um, the flip side of this is Milwaukee is playing good baseball. They're 10 games above 500. They're first in the Central. The Mariners are not 10 games above 500 and not first in the division, nor would they be first in the Central. Um, it probably helped them a little bit more to be in the Central than the West, but not that much if they're this bad. So, I just I thought that was interesting. So Milwaukee second base versus Mariners second base, both bad. And then if you want to just look at what what's Jesse Winker done? Oh boy, he's been substantially worse than last season this year. Last year, again he put up. I'm not looking at his WRC plus. I'm on Baseball Reference, but I think it was like 108. It was positive because he got on base so much. He walked a lot last year. 84 walks and 103 strikeouts last year. With a 688 OPS, that's good for a 102 OPS plus. So slightly above average, just right about above average for OPS last year with the Mariners. Super hard to believe, and also provided some of the worst defense in left field I've ever seen. Uh, not quite as bad as Raul Labanez, but it was getting there. That's how that's how you know. This year, he has a 63 OPS plus in 180 plate appearances. Played a little less than last year, but. Oh, has been worse. He has a 581 OPS. So my theory, there's there's just two things. One, maybe the Mariners didn't kill him. Maybe the Mariners didn't ruin him. Uh, obviously, coming from Cincinnati, probably the second most hitter-friendly ballpark in the league right behind Coors Field, and it's very close, especially for left-handed hitters. Obviously, it was gonna the production was going to come down a little bit. A little bit. Didn't foresee it falling off a cliff like it did last year. Despite that, still, theoretically by the numbers, right around league average, slightly above average at the plate last year, just by virtue of his 344 on base percentage. And he's still actually walking a good amount more than his, he's hitting this year. His batting average is 200 compared to 219 last year. And his on base percentage is 328. Uh, he just has a 253 slugging. <laughs> Which 
slugging that much less than your OBP is real bad. Last year, his slugging was equal to his OBP, which is also really bad. But it's crazy what has happened. So the one theory is maybe the manager didn't ruin him. Maybe he something happened. He just lost it. He never adjusted to hitting out of Great American Ballpark with Cincinnati. He lost something in his swing. Mental, I don't know. And also just wasn't a good fit in Seattle in the locker room. I don't think anyone liked him. Goes to Milwaukee. Has been so much worse. So maybe the Mariners didn't ruin him. The second theory is he came to the Mariners. The Mariners killed him. And we're just seeing him go on the downward spiral because he came to the Mariners. That's the other theory. Who knows what the real truth is. But uh, really interesting. That trade has not worked out for anyone. It has not worked out for anyone. Crazy. Crazy shit. Another thing that happened uh, this weekend, a tweet from MLB Trade Rumors hit the timeline that the Cardinals are interested in Logan Gilbert. I mean, of course they are. Uh, They've been rumored to be in trade talks with the Mariners. They, again, I talked about this. They, their needs complement each other greatly. The Cardinals are significantly more out of it than the Mariners at the moment, but they're still in the NL Central, so anything's possible. And... Uh, knee-jerk reaction on Twitter, obviously. Whenever any good player on your team is in a trade rumor, you're like, no, I don't want them to trade him. They shouldn't trade him. Logan Gilbert's really good. I had a whole thread on Twitter when that news came out about why, not why they should trade him, but if I was in the Mariners' front office, he would be the one I would be trying to trade for a litany of reasons. Um, basically what it boiled down to for me, uh, and I, I think I'm correct here in what front offices somewhat think. They obviously evaluate players and have their own system of evaluation. I don't know what they think of Gilbert and what they think of some of the Cardinals hitters that they'd trade for, but Logan's about to hit his special uh, Super 2 arbitration this next season after this offseason, and then he hits three more years of ARB after that. So that means paying him more than the league minimum. They're not going to trade Castillo. They're not going to trade Kirby. Kirby's generational. I think his ceiling is ace. Cy Young, Luis Castillo, they just extended, and he's great. Uh, Robbie Ray's hurt. They're not going to trade him. They wouldn't get that much back for him. Not going to trade Marco. Again, that wouldn't move the needle for any team. And then the rookies are team-controlled, have shown they can pitch really well in the Mariners' system, and they don't have to pay them for at least three years. So that lands on Logan Gilbert, and especially because he's proven that he can hack it in MLB. He's a great pitcher. He's a very solid pitcher that you can put in any rotation right now, and he'll give you a lot of good production. And down the stretch, that's what a contending team might want, especially over like a rookie. Like The rookies have been awesome. They have been great. I just think Logan has proven he's, for, for three years now, he's improved. And he's a solid pitcher and has a future in this league. And a contending team can can lean on him down the stretch. Like the Mariners kind of leaned on him and the and the rest of the pitchers last year. It'd be harder to convince a contending team to lean on Brian Wu or Bryce Miller. And also just from a financial perspective, it saves them the money for the next three years to get rid of Gilbert right now and keep those two heavily team-controlled, cheap rookie pitchers who they obviously probably think they can keep replicating like they've done the past four seasons is replicating drafting some college arms and producing solid starters out of them so I think trading Gilbert is in play I think I'm in favor and I love Logan Gilbert I really do but he would get at least one solid solid bat from a contending team like if the Cardinals want to give up one of their outfielders or Paul Goldschmidt for that for like I talked about on the trade deadline episode Logan, I think, could do that. Not just a straight swap. They're probably, you know, he could throw in some more players, prospects, whatever, from both sides. Logan could get you a lot. He's pitching great right now, too. He's been awesome, which has only enhanced his value. And as we approach the deadline and teams desperately need pitching, that value will only keep going up. As long as he stays healthy, that value will only keep going up until the trade deadline hits. And teams need pitching bad. Every team needs pitching. The Mariners could use another pitcher if Marco's injury is longer than we expect, maybe. But really, they got to get rid of some of this pitching. 
for offense. They're not going to win a World Series. They're barely even going to win. They're barely even going to attempt to make the playoffs with the current offense as it is. I want to sit here and convince myself, hey, I'm just going to, like, the pitching staff is what it is. It's an amazing pitching staff. Don't change it. Let's just hope the offense comes alive. Like, what if the offense just starts raking in the second half and they storm into the playoffs and make a run? I I have a hard time believing that's going to happen. It it could. Like, you look at the names in the lineup and you think, like, oh, this team should be better, and we've been saying that all year. But they haven't been. And it's just an observation of baseball fans on Twitter. So, obviously, no one wants to trade Logan Gilbert. I don't even want to trade him, but sometimes you got to... You got to get rid of players. You got to get rid of good players to get good players. And what they need is at least one very good offensive player to put in the lineup right now. Realistically, two. Realistically, one very good starting bat and then another solid bat that you can fill in off the bench. That would round out the team well and at least put them in a better position to make a playoff push in a very loaded American League. It's an observation of many baseball fans on Twitter and more just, you know, more casual baseball fans who wouldn't think of the more businessy side of things. Like, unfortunately I do. I'm not just a blind fan. I wish I was, but because of like this, this news, the Cardinals interested in Logan Gilbert came across the timeline. There's a lot of complaining about the team's stinky, stinky, stinky offense. And rightfully so. All right. The offense sucks. I also complain about it because it's true. And then when you talk about making any trades, nobody ever wants to trade away good pitching for some offense. It's like, no, we can't trade Logan. Trade away the rookies. It's like, I don't I don't know how much you're getting from a contending team for one of those rookies right now. I don't know if the bat you get in return for one of those guys moves the needle. Especially because I think their value is at its highest on the Seattle Mariners. I don't know if other teams are as confident they could get as much out of these guys right now. And like I said earlier, harder to lean on a rookie with 50 to 100 innings of MLB experience rather than Logan Gilbert, a proven good starter for one and a half years now. Proven at least three starter on most teams. And it's it's just you got to give up good players to get good players. Logan's loved by the fans, but it's like suddenly there's no complaining about the offense when you're wanting to trade away a good pitcher for some offense is what I'm saying. Like if you want good players in return, you generally have to give up good players. That's just how it works. And it's, I've seen like the same people and I'm, I'm not one to just like pull receipts on Twitter, but I will talk about it on my podcast. The same people I've seen tweet that like, we shouldn't trade away any prospects because they're the future are the same people who are like, no, we can't trade Logan. He's too good. You got to something has to happen. I just want to understand how they might think the offense should be addressed. And my guess would be a lot of them don't care how they address it. They just want it to be better. And that's fair. As a fan, that's fair. You want the the people in the front office to do their jobs, which is I mean, it's a fair assessment. And some of the, some of the blame is just like is it the hitting coach? Do they need to change the hitting coach? Do they need to change the coaching staff at all? Because some of it is the guys on the field just need to start hitting better. Ty France has been putrid recently. Kelnick has has like a 550 OPS the last month. Julio's been a league average hitter this year. It's been ugly sometimes to watch him at the plate. Ty Oscar, his, his numbers have dipped. Eugenio Suarez is aging and his numbers have dipped. I like I don't know. Sometimes you just got to hope the guys on the field can be better, but at this point, they got to do something. They have to make a trade to at least stop, like I said earlier, stop playing Pollock, stop playing Wong, stop playing Dylan Moore. They cannot continue to roll those guys out there. Those are the positions they got to fill, DH, whatever. And also, it was funny, I, I was talking about this yesterday, trading my Goldschmidt, and there was a dude in my mentions who, if you're listening, I doubt it, um, but if you're listening, no bad blood. This is a very amicable conversation he thinks differently about things, but it was comical what he said to me. He he was like, I was, I was talking about trading Logan Gilbert for Paul Goldschmidt in a trade of some type. That would include both those players, not necessarily just a swap. And I've talked about it, and I mentioned it on Twitter. I've mentioned it on the podcast. Goldschmidt expires after next season. The Cardinals really think they're out of it this year and don't want him to just expire after next year. 
they could get a pitcher for him in Logan Gilbert, who has four more arb years and would help them more down the line than maybe Goldschmidt does because they have such a loaded offense on paper right now. Uh, realistically, I think they'll trade outfielders first because they have a log jam there. Uh, I think, like, realistically, Newt Bar or, you know, like a Nolan Gorman or something, is, or Brendan Donovan is more realistic for the Mariners, like a second baseman or outfielder type is more attainable because uh, they have, you know, Jordan Walker trying to play outfield. They have Juan Yepes in the minors who will be up playing outfield for them soon. Like, but I mentioned Goldschmidt, and this guy parades into my mentions and is like, I'm more interested in Newt Barr or like Brandon Donovan. They're younger, more team control, and I get it. But it's literally Paul Goldschmidt. The reason he didn't want to trade for, if, if a trade that includes Logan Gilbert and Paul Goldschmidt, the reason he gave me, that he doesn't want the Mariners to trade for Paul Goldschmidt is that he's 35 and he's a rental, which he's not. One and a half years of Paul Goldschmidt is a rental I'd gladly pay. It's not like he expires after this year. Like, he's 35. It's Paul Goldschmidt. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? I don't understand what age has to do with anything. He literally just won MVP last year. Like, imagine... Like, two years ago, or even now, screw it, but like two years ago, if the Lakers were like, we're going to trade LeBron, and fan base were like, no, 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 he's he's 36, you can't trade for him. Who Age doesn't matter when we've, we're have we seeing what they're doing on the field. And I, I, I got into a conversation with this fella, and he essentially was like, I want players under 26 who are team controlled. And I'm like, that is a video game trade-ass mentality. I didn't say that to him, but it is. That's like the trades I target in MLB The Show. Yeah, I want the youngest, best players. Of course, everyone does. I also would like Paul Goldschmidt. He was like, the the guy, he he said something along the lines of, like, the window is opening right now. This is when the window is supposed to open. I don't want to trade away a team-controlled pitcher for a rental Paul Goldschmidt. And I was like, what? so trading away Logan Gilbert for Paul Goldschmidt, one and a half years of Paul Goldschmidt, closes the window right now? I, and he, and he, and then he replied, and then that was, I was done with that conversation. He replied, I mean, yeah, if you, if you think if Paul Goldschmidt, uh, turns us into a world series contender, I'll come on record and say, I think Paul Goldschmidt makes us more of a world series contender on the team than Logan Gilbert right now. The pitching has we can, you can pick up the slack in the playoffs with a lot of good pitching. The offense isn't going to win you games. Paul Goldschmidt would put them in a way better spot. Even him, even him alone might not do it, but I think marginally it would be a better team with Paul Goldschmidt on the team rather than Logan Gilbert. That conversation just killed me because his reason for not trading for Goldschmidt is because he's 35. Uh, Beyond me, why that is even a consideration at this point. Like, we, how many old players have we seen generational guys rake when they're that old? Like, come on. What are we doing? That being said, I don't want Logan to leave, but it just makes the most sense to have him as the trade right now. It just does. If they're not going to empty the farm, which I don't believe they should do, Logan makes the most sense by far. So we'll see what happens. I just wanted to mention that. And if you're if you're like Paul Goldschmidt's too old to trade for, I don't really understand uh, you at all. So that's my point. But that's uh, I'm I'm done talking about the Mariners. Before I go, I'm talking about Otani. I'm talking about the Angels again. I might just have to talk about him every week until he gets either traded or not. What a predicament the Angels have found themselves in. It, it's a predicament that does, you know, ultimately stem from their own incompetence, to be fair. But, like, what a pickle they're in. Like, do you trade Otani? Do you not trade Otani? Obviously, it's a lose lose situation. Because if you hold on to him and then lose him in free agency and you don't make the playoffs, they would get like a comp pick in like the 80 overall to 90 overall range, which is eesh, tough. And you just lose Otani in general, which is brutal. Seems like they're going to lose him no matter what. But if you trade him, you're punting on the season essentially, and you will, Artie Moreno, the owner, and Perry Manassi and the GM, will always go down in history as the guys who traded Shohei Otani away. Maybe the greatest player of all time. Maybe the greatest player that's ever played the game of baseball. 
This generation's Babe Ruth. You'd forever go down as a team as the guys who traded him. Like they're 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 already gonna be known as the guys who didn't win shit with him or Trout for six years. Manassian, to be fair, has only been there since twenty twenty, but still. I would I if I if it was me, I would hold on to him. Call me selfish. But I would hold on to him. Because if they really have no shot at re-signing him, this is, then this is the last time you will ever have Shohei Otani on your team in his prime. And so why not just squeeze everything out of it that you can and enjoy him while he's still there? Even if you don't make the playoffs, I think I'd still rather just have him on my team. Like, you could probably get some prospects and stuff, I guess. But really... I don't think that moves the needle for the Angels. I don't think they're like a couple MLB ready prospects away from being a good baseball team. They are deeply flawed. Like they can't win with Otani and Trout. And getting rid of Otani and thinking that the haul for him will will propel them to victory in the next few years is just flat out incorrect and probably won't happen. Uh, so that would be my strategy is to not trade him. Like I don't care if it's the wrong move. Even looking back, I just simply would never ever trade that guy if he's on my team he's too special he simply is too special and if you really want to go in like the mind of the front office or Artie Moreno the owner you imagine how much revenue you'd lose the revenue would tank if you traded him like the gate revenue would they'd lose out on like 5,000 people a night probably because it's not only you're punting on the season you're getting rid of Otani you're getting rid of a massive Asian American fan base that goes out to the ballpark to see Shohei Otani, and that is all they see. I have been to that stadium many times this season. They have countless Japanese um, ads, like at, like advertisers in the stadium too. Would they just pull the plug if Otani's not there? I don't know. I don't know. I just I wouldn't trade the guy. I just wouldn't. I can't be known in history as the guy who traded him. Like, even if you told me right now, like, if it's in absolute that the Angels will not make the playoffs this season, even if Trout comes back healthy and awesome, and Otani continues this and hits 60 home runs, or hits 63, breaks Judge's record, wins MVP again by far, puts up 12 war, and you still don't make the playoffs, I would not trade him. I would selfishly be like, no, he's on my team for the end of the season. He's never going to be on the team ever again. I would like to watch these final 70-ish games with him, please. That is what I do. That is my take on the matter. And I'm standing firm on that. He's too special for me to trade him for any for anything. I, I imagine I, I cooked this one up in an alternate universe where the Angels have now become the smartest, most savvy, prudent, ruthless team in the league. They've got like a backroom deal going on with Shohei, like a conspiracy. They've already re-signed him. No one knows. They've already re-signed him. And they've convinced him to let them trade him away right now for some great young pieces to round out the team. And then in the offseason, they announce that they re-signed him. And they'll they'll just hit the ground running in 2024. Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> that would be amazing. I that's happening right now somewhere. In an alternate universe where I am an Angels fan also doing a podcast, that's happening. I bet it is. You you can take that to the bank. That that's um that's it. I'm done with the Otani talk. Imagine if that happened. That would never happen, but I wouldn't trade him. It's definitely the biggest storyline in the league right now because the Angels are reeling, and will they trade him? Will they not? There's a lot of, a lot of, that's all the talk basically right now. That's all the talk that's going to lead up to the trade deadline. There's a lot of other players on the line. He's number one. Will they trade him? Will they not? I don't know. I don't know. It's going to be insane if they do. I just want to know, I want to know what teams value him highly right now. Like, what would they, obviously every team values him highly, but what team would want to trade for him as a rental right now? Um, It's not that he's expensive. It's like, who has the prospects? Like, the Dodgers, maybe the Yankees. Like, a lot of teams could pony up for him, but who will? 
because I'm sure people are hitting their line. And before I go, the Rockies apparently, so uh, Dick Monfort, the owner of the Rockies, has not ruled out training, trading for Otani. Um, there was an email screenshot showed that said he's a free agent at the end of the year, but would be fun for a couple months. That, fuck yeah. Are you kidding? That is the energy we want to see. I love the Rockies. They, no one knows what they're cooking. They're just vibing, doing who knows what. And the owner is like, you know what? Fuck it. Why don't we just trade for him? It'd be a fun couple months. Yeah. Yeah, it would. Shohei and Coors. Are you serious? That'd be amazing. Like, that. that is the energy I want from my owner sometimes. It's like, fuck it. Let's just have some fun. The Rockies aren't winning anything anytime soon. Let's trade for Shohei. Let's give the fans three months of Shohei Otani to watch. Like, that's amazing. I love that. Imagine. Imagine they trade for Shohei Otani. That'd be... Oh, that'd be amazing. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with the podcast. I'm just... uh, (sighs) I'm glad the Mariners won today. Uh, They... They right now are still just middling at 500. They can't seem to go above or below it by more than a couple games. Like they're 46 and 46. They're eight back of the division lead. They are four and a half back of the of the wild card. Still not out of play, but every team in the AL East is cooking. And Texas has cooled off, but still look like a solid team. Houston is is not. As Death Star Astros Z as usual, but they're still definitely better than the Mariners. Like the Angels are, you know, they're hanging around because they still have Shohei Otani, which helps, and the best hitter on the planet, Mickey Moniak. But the playoff odds right now, the Mariners are, are sitting at 15%, which was, it was about 24 before they dropped two to the Tigers. So that's great. But uh, I'll leave you with that. So the Mariners, they continue the homestand. They got the Twins and the Blue Jays, uh, two two tough American League teams to play here. The Twins are Twins are a very weird team. The Blue Jays should be better, and are really good. Also a weird team. Uh, the Twins offense is putrid, uh, but the pitching is great. Similar to the Mariners, actually, quite a similar team makeup. So uh, we'll see who breaks in that series. Who who which offense comes alive, or if we're getting pitching duels every night, which is very possible. But if you're listening this far. Appreciate you so much. Uh, recommend the show to your friends, you know, or don't. Do whatever you want. You have free will. Uh, but thanks for listening this far. Drop a rating or review if you're really feeling spicy. Uh, doesn't even need to be about the podcast or baseball. If you want to write a review about something else, go for it. Screw it. Uh, but appreciate y'all. Have a good rest of your week. And, of course, go Mariners. <laughs>